All right, it's 7.05. Maybe we should get started. Um, like I already said, thank you all for being here with us. I am delighted to welcome our special guest, Heather Dune McAdam, and all of you to be with us today in this event. Um, as we commemorate the 76th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, um, I am Professor Dr. Valente, visiting assistant professor the, uh, of Holocaust studies at the Ackerman Center, um, as well as the producer and co-host with um, Dr. Niels Romer um, of the Ackerman Center Ho Holocaust podcast, which actually starts back up this Sunday. Um, this evening, I will be introducing our special guest and later on we'll also be moderating the Q&A. So I'd like to um, point to all of you to look at the little chat at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions throughout um, the talk, feel free to just type in your questions and then we'll get to them um, at the very end, okay? Um, I'm delighted to introduce our special speaker. Um, Heather Dune McAdam is the acclaimed author of the international bestseller 999, The Extraordinary Young Women of the First Official Jewish Transport to Auschwitz, which has been translated into 16 languages and is a finalist for the Goodreads People's Choice Award. Ms. McAdam is a New York Foundation of the Arts Fellow, and she is also the producer and director of the documentary film 999, which is based on this book um, that she will be talking to us about. And you can learn more about the documentary by visiting their website at 999thmovie.com. McAdams calling seems to be to write about the lost girls of the Holocaust. In her very first book, Rena's Promise, a story of sisters in Auschwitz. Um, it was a memoir which she co-authored with survivor Rena um, Gillison. And Rena's Promise started Heather on this journey um, of working with the women who had been on that first transport to Auschwitz. She is currently working with her partner, Simon Warren, on a new biography um, that is titled Star Cross, the Romeo and Juliet story in Hitler's Paris which is about a couple who frequented the Café Flore in 1942 and were friends with the likes of Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Jean Patratre, and all the other well-known artists of the time. So we also look forward to that um, upcoming book as well. Um, McAdams' work has been recognized um, by various associations, uh, such as the Society of Authors, Yad Vashem in the UK, Yad Vashem uh, in the UK, the Shoah Foundation in California, the National Museum of Jewish History in Bratislava, Slovakia, as well as the Memorial Museum of Auschwitz in Auschwitz, in Poland. She is the director of the Rena's Promise Foundation, and she has also sat on the advisory board of the Cities of Peace in Auschwitz, which was completed this last January. Uh, she divides her time between New York and um, England. And with that, I will turn over the mic to Ms. McAdam. And we really are grateful for you for being here with us today. And we look forward to listening to your wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, and, uh, and to uh, the Ackerman Center and to everybody. I actually got an email from one of your students, who I believe is in India, um, who is uh, on tonight, or I hope or in the morning in India, um, I heard, I saw your lineup coming up and I just wanted to say that 999 is in Spanish and in Catalan, oops, I just lost my light. Um, and um, sorry about that. And uh, yeah, so I was actually, sorry about that. Uh, technical difficulties. Oh, we can still see you. <laughs> okay, there we go. That worked. I don't wanna, okay. I'm sorry, now you've got a reflection, but I can't help it. Um, anyway, I was actually in um, on my uh, book tour in Spain when COVID happened. <laughs> so um, anyway, it was very exciting to, um, it is wonderful to see um, books that are in translation. Um, I'm going to start this evening um, with a, um, I'm, I'm gonna do a slideshow and I'm going just going to share my screen got the sound up and um, all right. And so I'm gonna start uh, for everybody. Um, we lost three women from the first transport this year. And that was Edith Grossman, who I worked with extensively over the past three years um, on this book and the documentary. Uh, Ella Rutman, um, who uh, Edith is speaking to uh, right here. And this is Etta Newman. And um, this is a very international 
a project that I've been working on. So um, since this is International Hol uh, Holocaust Remembrance, um, I, um, I hope you with me will light a candle in your heart in the memory of these very um, powerful, extraordinary women who were teenage girls when they arrived in Auschwitz. Um, so part of my work is um, I am doing a documentary. I realized that um, you know if you don't film survivors, um, uh, you can't. Uh, you know, there's something different between writing a book and being able to actually see the survivors speaking. Um, so this year was difficult, but I did find after the book came out two other survivors. Uh, one was in Australia, and we uh, did a Zoom uh, distance filming with her. That's Elizabeth Silverman Bentz. And um, she was six, turned 16 on March 25th, 1942, which is the day she was deported to Auschwitz. She was in the cattle car on her 16th birthday. A uh, Judith Spielberg um, middleman, um, no relation, um, <laughs> is um, in, in America. And I was able to go and um, visit her in person and film her. She is the last survivor of her village. Um, and we have three additional survivors who are still with us. Um, Regina Schwarzova Preter, who is in America, um, Laura Spinakova Ritterova, who is in Slovakia, and Olga Grosova Liktig, who is in Israel. So um, that is, uh, these were the teenagers who I fell in love with. And as old women, I am here to share their stories with all, uh, all of you this evening. Um, I'm going to be sharing a presentation that also has excerpts from the documentary. And so um, you're, we're going to go in between images and uh, documents and film. And uh, so just give you an overview of what we're doing tonight and uh, we will start now. The whole tragedy starts with the girls. In my eyes, the girls were the worst. They have been the first victims. Slovakia, the eastern portion of Slovakia, is where our story begins. And uh, it all started with uh, Adela Gross and Rena Kornreich. So the very first book um, that Sarah mentioned was Rena's Promise. And Rena uh, witnessed this beautiful young woman, uh, red hair, um, and uh, who everybody knew in their town of Humina in Slovakia, she witnessed her going to the gas chamber. And when we wrote the book, it's a pivotal moment in the book uh, because Adela was healthy and Rena did not know why she was selected to die. And um, 70 years later, the family found out what happened because of that testimony, because we had written that testimony. And that for me is why um, this work of, um, of Holocaust research and writing and filmmaking and studies is so important because we never know where the stories are going to come from and, and how we might end up giving peace to a family um, who, you know, they didn't know and now, and now they know what happened to Adela. And, um, and, and it's uh, very powerful for me. Adela was very good friends with Edith Grossman, who um, I worked, I met uh, in 2017 in Slovakia. I started to film her. And Leia, um, this it, here, this is Leia. Um, and this is another one of their friends, Anna Hertzko Bikova. Um, so Edith um, 
a 17 Leia was 19 when they uh, thought they were going to be going to a shoe factory. Um, and their classmates and childhood friends, that, you know, they all signed up for work. And um, Edith here in this wonderful uh, little footage um, is looking at this photograph and identifying the Jewish girls from her class in 1938 of the girls on the first transport with her in her class. She is the only survivor. Um, and that is super important to me that um, we can recognize, I, we know their names, Regina Grebervova, um, and you know, we know what happened to them. So we don't, aren't just looking at names in a list we have faces connected to them. So Edith tells us how they woke up one morning and... It was glued on their houses, an announcement that all the Jewish girls, non-married girls from 16 up, have to come to the school on this and this street, the 20th of March, 1942. My parents had two girls right to go. My mother was so against and, and my father, he was so, so disciplined, you know. He said, it's a law, we have to do it. And my mother said, it's a bad law. And my father said, but it's a law and we have to send those kids. My mother said, eh, hey, you don't have to go or something like, you know. And that was the first time maybe that I disobeyed my mother. So I said, no, I want to go with my friends. Friends are very important at that point. So I, uh, I didn't want to be left behind. So we went uh, to the school and it was a formal checkup, really a formal checkup. And there was something that, it were, that we were very surprised and Esses was sitting there. The doctor and an essence by the table when they were checking us. So, this is the original list from Humina Slovakia. You can see this is um, at Edith and Leah Friedmanova. That was um, our, our my heroines, and this is the street that they lived on. So. Edith explains to us that they went to the school to register. Well, if you didn't have your name checked off, then they could go to the house and pick you up. And, um, and that's what happened in the case of Bertha Bergovitz, who you are now going to meet. They told my parents that they were gonna take me to work and uh, there was no other choice. I had to stay, say goodbye to my father and to Hershey and my mother came with me the next time to Kapishova. And we stayed there overnight. Of course, nobody slept much. And from there, the next day, we were taken by buses to the city of Stropkov, where all the girls were congregated. There were older girls from our neighborhood, so mother asked them they should take care of me. So I was always with, this, with these girls. I remember my father blessed me. And you know what? I walk around with my father's hands over my head. It's very comforting, very good for me. They suddenly took us out and, and we marched and an SS with us. Told the parents I began to shout and cry and shout and cry. And my mother, I heard her, I'm hearing her now. Oh, she said, about Leah, I am not, not so worried she's strong and, but Edith, she's like nothing. I couldn't understand what was going on because soldiers were lined up on both sides of the street and, and she was um, among the people having a, carrying a, a luggage that was uh, weighing her down. So they gathered the girls from the eastern end of uh, Slovakia, Bargy of Stropkov, Prussia of Mikovic, and all the villages. And they came, the girls came in trains, passenger trains, in horse carts, in, um, in trucks, and in buses. And uh, many of the girls were really excited. They thought they were going to go work in a shoe factory. 
And um, the younger girls like Edith were quite scared because um, they'd never been away from home. So the older girls would you know, tell jokes and encourage them. And at one point um, I was told that um, they sang the Slovak national anthem on the way to Poprad. Poprad had an empty barracks where the girls were concentrated. And it took about five or six days for them to get uh, 999 young women together. And so Edith arrived on uh, the first day and, you know, and then people came, uh, young women came later and later and later. Um, they slept on the floor, they were in hammocks and a starvation diet began. Um, and we are talking, uh, you know, like one day potatoes, one day beans, and the amount of uh, meat was six ounces per week, which is about the size of a tin of cat food. Um, that's what they had to eat. What they didn't know was um, that they were being uh, not sold to the Nazis, but the Slovak government was paying the Nazis to take their Jews. And these girls were the first ones that they were paying. Uh, and the, it is the equivalent of $3,000 uh, today. It was 200 Reichmark at that time. And of course the Slovak government um, called it rehoming, which you we all know what rehoming meant. That was um, to be, for the girls, it was to be worked to death. And then of course, um, it would become a death camp. The other thing the Slovak government had to pay for, and this is an extraordinary document that I just received this summer. Um, this is the original uh, railway invoice. You can see coming from Poprad Tatry to Auschwitz. I'm sorry, it's a little bit blurry. This is the number of people that are going to be on the train. There are 999 young women and one doctor. Um, this is the amount for their luggage, 360 Reichmark and 3,700 Reichmark for all of the young women. And here's our date, March 25th, 1942. Uh, the person who had this, the family found it in their mother's archive after she passed away. And she had worked, uh, uh, she was on the first transport and she had worked in uh, for the Gestapo, one of the Gestapo officers. So she must have found this and um, confiscated it uh, before it could be destroyed. Um, so uh, they go, um, of course, they are in Poprad and they end up uh, getting onto this train, it's cattle cars. And uh, this is probably the longest segment we'll see tonight, but I can't tell it any better than, uh, than these young, the, our survivors. The list. Okay, Everybody can name. There's a Della Gross's name. This is a Pope Cod representation. We have to line up, five in rows, and march to the railroad station. And far away, we saw already a long truck of cattle cars. We didn't even think of it that those are suited. For us, <laughs> we are human beings. The guards started screaming in Slovakian, actually, up, up, dirty Jewish horse, and so on. They put us in trains. We didn't know where we are going. We didn't have any idea. We were about 50 or maybe 60. Not water, not anything, not a little window, and locked from outside. The train stopped in the middle of a field. There was an empty place, a side, nothing. When we came closer, we saw the barbed wire and we saw the barracks. We came and marched through an iron gate. The gate opened, on top Arbeit macht frei. On the left side was a huge brick building with a huge sim chimney. So we, we whispered to each other, that's the factory where we are going to work. We just wondered. <laughs> 
We just wondered what's going to happen to us. We were the first thousand women who ever entered the gates of hell there. wasn't supposed to do that. So this is uh, from the Auschwitz Memorials Museum. And if you've ever been to Aus the Auschwitz Museum, the main entrance is right here. That's where the Arbeckmark Frei archway is and where the guard gate is. And um, and that this is well, this was the men's camp in 1942. The women had to march all the way around over to here, past the crematorium gas chamber, provisional gas chamber crematorium, which they thought was the factory, and come in this direction, okay? And these are, these 10 blocks were all women's blocks. Um, this is block 11, block Smerci, which is the um, death block. It's where they tortured prisoners and the execution wall is right here. Um, I should probably try my little, there we go. Um, so that was the execution wall right there. And um, and block 10, this block was the first block where um, they were held. And this is footage from block 10. Yeah. Oh, so block 10 is not open to the public, um, but I've been allowed to go in there several times to um, do my research, and then I have to come with it. Um, uh, downstairs with the little Upstairs, um, the, this is the block of his room. Was this the block of his room? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that her name was so Elsa. Elsa was in there. And all of these there were bunks all along here, and the women slept about two to a bunk, um, two or three years. Um, not much worse than worse than her now. This um, block ten also. In 1943, it becomes where experiments and sterilization is done on women. So um, the, you all know about the processing that happens when you arrive in Auschwitz. Um, the the first women, you know, that it is what how they processed women is the same as they did in Ravensbrück, uh, which is the um, German uh, concentration camp for German prisoners, and um, and so they did the same. But of course, um, they did not <laughs> um, get to keep their things. If you were Aryan, you got to keep your items uh, in Ravensbrück. But when you came to Auschwitz, uh, the Jewish prisoners had nothing, so everything they brought with them was confiscated, and um, and the girls were so innocent that um, Loris. Uh, Laura, who is one of our survivors today, Ritorova, she actually um, said that when they took her earrings, she said, oh, don't worry, we're gonna make so much money, we're gonna be able to buy new earrings. Um, they really just had no idea. The kind of work that they did was um, horrendous. Uh, Edith's job was cleaning, um, cleaning the lager, the camp road of snow and garbage and when I asked her, well, did you use shovels or brooms? She said, no, we used hands, our hands and newspapers. Um, she also had to clean swamps. The other job that they had to do, and this is footage from a movie called uh, Ostatni Etap, I'm saying it badly, it's Polish, uh, or The Last Stage, and it was filmed in 1948 in Auschwitz. They were demolitioning buildings. These are teenage girls, okay? And they um, had these bizarre, things that they rocked to push over brick walls of buildings. And if you were on the wrong side of it, you got crushed, right? So um, this is uh, one of the jobs that the first women had to do in 1942. The other, and um, this is a regular job you're gonna see here 
I've tried to slow down this footage so you can actually see this reenactment. They're passing bricks back and forth. When they didn't know what to do with the pr female prisoners, they would have them move bricks back and forth from one side to the other. And if you dropped the brick, you were beaten. Um, and their hands would just bleed and be covered with blisters because they couldn't, um, you know, they had to throw them to each other. Um, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in, in August of 1942, August 10th, uh, the women were moved from Auschwitz I and the men's camp to the women's, to uh, Birkenau. This is five kilometers away. Uh, we all know what Birkenau is. Um, we've seen the death gate, you know how large it is. But at this point, it was not this large. Um, so this was the original women's camp. Um, and uh, I'll tell you where our survivors were. Block 27, Bertha Berkowitz was in that block. Block 13 was where Edith was. Block 25 is, um, that was the sick block. And if you ended up there, you, uh, you ended up in the gas chamber and that's where Edith's sister Leah died on December 5th, 1942 of typhus. Um, these are the latrines and um, over here and the, um, the washrooms, although the water was not anything worthy of washing. And, um, and this is some footage here of the blocks today. You can see here, these are the koyas, the shelves that the girls uh, slept in, often 10 or 12 at a time. And, um, and the structure is based on a stable, right? So these should be horse stalls. Um, and uh, that they use the same structure as the Polish army used for their horses, which tells you about what they thought of, of Jews. Um, they probably treated their horses much better. And, um, and you know, they were very cold um, and, and because they were so close together, they, um, you know, typhus was, uh, we had a terrible typhus epidemic in, um, in, in Auschwitz. And this is how large Birkenau was right, uh, or is today. This is this amazing drone shot. I'm gonna show this to you again. If, if you've never been there, it is absolutely overwhelming. It, it is like 11 football fields. I think it might be more. It's so huge, you can't, the women's camp is right over here. And they used to have to walk from one end to the other. So they might be working over here and you'd have just walking that distance is, is that's about 20 minutes. And if you were working in uh, Auschwitz one, which some of the girls, you had five kilometers each way to work every day. Um, so uh, uh, this, um, this is, uh, we're going to talk a little bit of, if you were going to survive three years in Auschwitz, uh, you were going to have to get a better job. And many women worked in Canada. This is the ruins of Canada, just the foundations. And this is the granddaughter of, um, I'm gonna go back there. Um, this is just a gif, but um, I'll show this again. Um, this is the granddaughter of Ida Eigerman, who I traveled with to Auschwitz. And, um, and she is walking where her grandmother uh, worked in Canada. This is the sauna over here where they processed uh, women or uh, people. And uh, Canada was right next to the gas chambers. So um, here we have uh, Linda Reichbreiter who um, immigrated to America. Um, she was on the first transport and this is one of her best friends, uh, Mira uh, Kornhauser Gold. And they worked in Canada. They knew each other for until uh, they were old ladies um, for years. Um, this uh, photograph was taken. It's a posed photograph by the SS to show the uh, Red Cross how well prisoners were being treated in Auschwitz. And, um, and they were forced to smile. So there you go. Yeah, um, just on this side over here. Uh, Hungarian Jews were heading to the gas and many of the women um, of the first transports um, saw their families heading to the gas. So uh, we are commemorating um, the liberation of Auschwitz, which is 76 years ago today. But on the 18th of January, 76 years ago, the death march began. 
and many prisoners um, who were ill decided not to stay in Auschwitz because they were afraid that they were going to lock the gates and um, light the perimeter and kill everybody inside. So um, the death march from here was on foot um, and they, uh, many different groups, it's, you know, um, most of the women came here to Wojciechowski, um, but some ended up walking for almost a week in, a, in blizzard, blizzard conditions. But if they ended up in Wojciechowski, which Edith and most of the women that um, I've uh, interviewed, they picked up a train there and then we come here and the trains went up to Ravensbrück. Um, one train ended up in Mauthausen, um, and then um, and then one of my survivors actually ends up going with Anne Frank in November 1944 to Bergen-Belsen. Um, so I guess my point is uh, liberation was not, for many, many prisoners, was not January 27th, 1945. Um, the Russians came in and liberated Auschwitz uh, and um, and these are, this is a group of women who are leaving, but, um, but for many of the women that I've worked with, um, they would not be liberated until April and May, 1945. So let's talk about the liberation of Europe here. Um, so uh, you met um, Bertha Berkowitz. Bertha was liberated in Bergen-Belsen where there was a terrible typhus epidemic. This is Bertha right here. And this is a few days later, um, she's, uh, getting fed. Um, she's showing um, uh, British soldiers. Um, actually, she's just coming back from the, the death pits. Um, and um, so she actually, and she was able to find her sister. Most of her family was gone, but she did find her sister, which is a wonderful story. Um, this is Ida Eigerman. Uh, you just saw her granddaughter and she's knitting in a displaced persons camp. We found this photo in the JCC archive. So exciting. Um, this is Rena and Danka. They ended up in Holland. And this is a fantastic uh, archival photo. We have here three women that I know of from the first transport. This here is um, Marta Mengel and her cousins here. This is Fanny and Etta Zimmerspitz. Um, Etta is uh, one of the survivors who we just lost this year. These women came, uh, they got to Prague and, um, and there were no trains by the time they got there. And so um, these gentlemen are Poles and Czech and they walked this group of women all the way home to Slovakia so that they would not be raped or accosted um, on their way home. And I just, you know, it's such a beautiful story that, that, um, that they were protected um, after such horrendous um, prejudice and racism and, uh, and loss. Uh, these are um, two other photos of, or three other photos of women from the first transport. Um, one of the things that girls did when they were liberated is they went back to high school. So this is Bertha Berkowitz and her friend, uh, Lenka Zuckerman, they went back to high school. Edith went back to high school. Um, this, uh, some of my group were actually liberated and ended up in Sweden. And um, this is 10 days in of freedom. And, uh, and this is Lily and her sisters. This is Ella Rutman, who we just lost this year and her other sister, whose name was Edith as well. And that was uh, May, 1945. We think that's May 4th, 1945. Uh, and over here is, um, I know her name. Her name is Margaret Kulik. If you've read the book, it's Peggy Kulik. And all of these women, except for the little girl were on the first transport. I do not know all their names. When uh, Margaret says their names, she only gives her first names. So I can't, I, I don't know everybody's name in it, um, but it is such an extraordinary. So what did you do when you were liberated? Well, you got married and you had kids, you went to school um, and, uh, and you tried to have a normal life, which is really, really important. Rena once said to me um, that she felt sort of, um, she, she didn't feel very smart because when she was asked what she did, uh, with it after liberation, she said, I had babies. And, um, and I think that that's really key for women uh, surviving genocide is to, 
to create a life of hope and a future for um, for their uh, for their people and for their family. Um, so uh, thank you so much, and I'm open to questions. Um, and I will stop my screen share. I have to find the thing to click. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> there it is. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Heather. I'm sure that everyone is clapping. This was really wonderful to, to listen to your presentation. And we are open for questions. Um, if anybody has a question and would like to type in in the chat box. And while we wait for a question, I think I'll go ahead and ask the first one if I may. Um, we know that from that first transport, only 20, 20 of these young women survived. And so how did you, I believe it's probably through Rena that you came to know about the rest of the group, but would you talk to us a little bit about how did you actually find Rena, or who did you come across first and how did you get in touch with this group of women? Yeah, well, I, I met Rena at, um, <laughs> I, a friend of mine played tennis with her and and found out that she was on the first transport and and um, and she said you should write a book and Rena said um, I, I would love to but I, I don't know a writer and my friend said I know a writer and uh, and we met and we clicked immediately we just had, you know it was like <clears throat> we were just immediately best friends for life and um, and actually in the early 90s I thought, um, I contacted the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, actually, I, that was much later. Um, that was in 2012. I contacted the Shoah Foundation and asked them if they could help me um, figure out how many women had survived at, through testimonies because I had not been able to find a list of names. I was trying to create a list. And with the Shoah Foundation, we found 22 survivors. And, uh, and I thought that that was it. And then I learned um, that that number is actually based on numbers, uh, not just from the Shoah Foundation, but also from Slovakia. And, um, and his, the historian who um, in, in Slovakia, he was basing his research on how many women came back to Slovakia that he knew of. And many women didn't. So I actually, uh, I think, um, over 150 probably survived at this point. I know of about, um, I, it's sort of circuitously, I know of about 60. I haven't met all of them. A lot of them are gone already. But, um, but I also know that some didn't share their stories because they were block elders or they had positions that they didn't want anybody to know about. And so they kept, they kept it secret. And so I think there, I think there is probably more. Um, we won't know for sure, but that list, finding that list, was absolutely pivotal. And Edith was a huge resource because um, she knew just about everybody in her town, and um, and so I was able through Edith to um, connect, and and then families found me through Rena's Promise. Uh, so I set up a form on my website for venuspromise.com uh, and I said, if you know anybody, and this was 2012, and people started to contact me. Regina Schwartzova um, Preter, her, her daughter contacted me. And, um, you know, and, and I just, the, um, the, the Gross family, they contacted me. And now I'm like an honorary Gross, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's just, um, and actually Edith ended up her, um, her uh, Adela's sister, was Edith's sister-in-law. So, you know, it's a very small country. <laughs> Everybody just about knows each other. So what it was dominoes. Um, once, mm -hmm. once I found Edith, it just was like, they, they, all, they all appeared or the families appeared with stories for me. That's phenomenal. And it sounds like they were waiting for somebody to come along also to tell their stories. So that's really, really I wonderful. They started it sooner when they were all still alive. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, we have a question here. Would you talk a little bit about the reason for Adela selection? You mentioned this during the presentation. Uh, what was the reason for Adela selection that was discovered? We don't know. We have no idea. Um, I, I, I theorize in the book, I theorize that, mm -hmm. um, that first of all, she was healthy and beautiful. Um, she may have thwarted an SS attention, and um, and perhaps you know that was it. But you know they had a quota, and 
it was, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't a democracy, right? If, if, if two, if one thumb said you live and the other thumb said you die, you know, it, it didn't matter, right? If two thumbs said you, you know, it just, you, you died. And, and so, you know, it, there was just no reason. And that's why, um, that's why it really, um, I think that's why it really stuck in Rena's mind. Um, and it was, she was so upset. And the other reason that she was so upset by that memory, because you're watching so many people die every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, was that Adela uh, helped others into the lorries and who were crying and, um, and, and terrified and she helped them and calmed them and comforted them on the way to the gas chamber. Um, the other thing that, um, that I, I learned not from, <laughs> not from Rena, and she kept it a secret from me, which I think is really interesting, is that selections were done in the nude. And um, all the time I worked with Rena, she never told me that. And, um, and I heard it in the testimony of Joan Rosner. And, um, and I went to Edith and I went, were you guys naked when you got us? Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like, what? what? Like, why has nobody ever told me this? Why is this, a, you know, and, and of course it's a huge shame mm -hmm. to be, um, to be nude in front of, you know, men, but even, you know, to be, to be naked in front of women, this is a very conservative culture. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and, and that, that the selections were done like that on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there was a reason for it. They were looking for spotted typhus. Um, but you know, it was also just dehumanizing and shaming. Exactly. For that first, one of the first things that happened is this dehumanization of the woman, especially by, by, you know, carrying out the procedure in that way. And someone is asking if you could please elaborate a little bit about, uh, what do we know about the men who walk the women home, um, that you mentioned about the ones who were, you know, the good men who helped, because we also know a lot of what happened with the liberation, unfortunately. Uh, was the violation of, of a lot of these survivors. And so would you talk a little bit about this? Well, I, I don't know anything about the men. I, I haven't found any of them. And it was, a, it was so long ago when I got that, I got that photograph just a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, what I can say about, um, about the survivors that I know is uh, none of the survivors that I know were raped after liberation. Um, they um, they were protected. Edith, Edith um, there was some. The, the Russians were um, the Russians raped a lot of especially German prisoners and capos and that. Um, and they were certainly you know looking for uh, love in all the wrong places. But Edith, um, uh, so Russian soldiers find Edith and the group of girls that she's with, and they come and they feed them, and you know, and and they think they're going to spend the night and the girls say no no we're virgins and um and they um they say oh okay then we'll leave and then the captain comes back <laughs> and he says but I'm the captain <laughs> and they and they um and they say no no you know like we're your virgins we're not gonna you know we're not gonna need and he left so he left and so there was a sense of respect in that way and the and this very sweet thing in that story was that some Polish men uh, in the in the next farm came and said they're going to come back tonight. We're taking you in in a wagon, and and we're taking you to a train. And so, um, you know, th th there um, it, it is war, and and there are horrible stories. But I never met a single survivor, and I think part of that is because um, uh, they were uh, not very attractive. Um, they had lice, <laughs> they, um, you know, they, they weren't, um, they may not have uh, been what they were looking for. And would you talk a little bit about how you actually came across the very first, uh, the, the story of the very first transport? How did this actually happen? Well, I found Rena and, um, and I will say that when Rena told me she was on the first transport, Jewish transport and um, to Auschwitz, I, I'd never heard of it and I didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was living in North Carolina. I went to the Wake Forest University archives and, uh, and started looking it up. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is real. So this is, um, this is a very used book, as you can see. It's my uh, Czech uh, Denuta, I'm sorry, Denuta Czech uh, Auschwitz Chronicle. It's the day-to-day -day, um, 
uh, mm -hmm. workings of Auschwitz. And, and that, uh, you know, it is my Bible for what was happening. Um, but, you know, um, for years, it's been a footnote. The mm -hmm. first transport was identified, but that it was all young women. Um, it, it's, I, I can't tell you how many Holocaust books I've looked at where it's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I, and I think that that is, I think it's a travesty and I think it's a sign of the times that now we're being recognized. I think it's a very sort of me too moment. Um, but um, that they have been ignored for so long. And people always ask me, why do you think that? Well, I'll tell you, it's, I think it's misogyny. And I also think it's teenage girls. Teenage girls aren't important, right? What are they gonna do? They're not intellectuals, they're not men. Um, and so, you know, they have been swept under the rug of Holocaust history. And, uh, and yet they survived longer than any Jewish men um, in Auschwitz. And, um, and they did it um, uh, through street smarts and uh, not always being nice, and, um, but also through sisterhood and taking care of each other. And you know, they're human beings. They weren't all angels, um, but they weren't all devils. And, uh, and they give us an incredible uh, snapshot into uh, humanity and how to maintain your humanity in, in in absolutely impossible circumstances. Absolutely, and we have one last question here. I think we have time for one more, uh, which touches on you know your experience writing the book and then making the documentary. Would you please talk to us about the challenges as well as the advantages to of making a documentary from the book and your research? So, well, I started um, I started as a documentary because I didn't want to write another Holocaust book. Uh, you don't do this lightly, as all of you know, if you're getting your PhDs. <laughs> um, nobody wants to invite you to a party um, and ask you what you do. Um, and uh, and I and because I think testimony is so important, I wanted to film everybody, and I and I really wanted to create a historic, dramatic record. Um, but you know, you can only cover so much in film. And, um, and it, you know, there is so much and there's still more. I mean, I'm still getting stories. And, um, and my husband actually said to me, you know, you got to write a book too. And the, probably the biggest problem with a movie is raising money, <laughs> right? Um, a book, I can sit down and write a book. And I, and I did. And, um, and, and it's, it's you know been published and the movie uh, we are editing it we're in editing process but we're still raising money so I'm really glad that you know I, I did write a book because we have that record and I think the two together will work really wonderfully educate in an educational um, area I I hope you know it. Um, I, I always want to speak to young people because you know the next generation, um, you know, they're not going to have Holocaust survivors. So I think it's really important for us to create um, dramatic, honest nonfiction um, that chronicles this time period in history in a in a way that is realistic. And and um, you know, I I. Bit of a stickler. I, I, I'm not a big fan of Holocaust fiction because I don't think it does a, a service, and um, it they it tends to um, sentimentalize something and um, and give you dramatic arcs that may or may not have existed, and to make people that were not nice people nicer than they should have been, or what or whatever, right? Or you just get historical inaccuracies which don't serve the the um, you know the truth. So um, I, I think it's really important work. Uh, and I think it's really important work for humanity. Um, so that so as Edith said, war serves no one. That's her message. Mm -hmm. Nobody wins. Um, everybody loses. And and so, um, you know, that was her hope in, in working with me and doing the documentary and doing, and that and that's really how we do end the book with, with her message to humanity um, about, about that, which I think it's a really important thing for us to remember. And I just, I just remembered a little story I wanna share with you guys, cause it's a it's liberation great. story. And, um, and Edith, uh, and, it, and it's 
particular to, to women, right? So one of the things that happens when you arrive in Auschwitz as a young woman is you stop having your period. And it happens very quickly. And it's because you're not eating enough and you're working too hard and, and you lose body fat. And um, on uh, the day that they came, that there was somebody riding a bicycle and they were saying, the war is over, this war is over. You can, and the girls came out of hiding. Edith got her period the day of liberation. And she was jumping up and down saying, I'm a woman again, I'm free. I'm a woman again, I'm free. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really beautiful um, to hear. Uh, we had one last question about the number 999. Is that, that has to do simply with the number of the women, is that correct? Or is there another significance to the number itself that you used in the title of the book? There is, yeah. It's um, that, please? yeah. There's a whole chapter on this, um, and uh, and you have to remember um, Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, was very big in occult and astrology, and uh, and numerology. And um, and when I was doing my research, I became aware um, that um, that he ordered Himmler ordered 999 German prisoners, female prisoners from Ravensbrück to come and be the kapas, the prison guards over uh, the first women. And I went, well, that's weird. Why are there two 999s? So I contacted a historical astrologer and a numerologist. And I said, is there anything to this? Um, and the first person said, no, you're crazy. And I just didn't believe that I was that because Himmler was a control freak. I know this about Himmler, right? I mean, he just, um, I just had it. It was like that gut instinct. And I found, um, I found a historical astrologer who um, the first thing he said was, oh, this is really interesting. Let me take a look into it. And um, he came back a couple of weeks later and he had, he had found um, just incredible astrology that, I don't believe in, right? It's like, but I think Himmler believed in it. And the thing with the nine is it is the last single digit number. And if you want to emphasize something, so if you want to end something, nine is the number you use in a cult. And if you want to uh, really finalize something, you trine it, nine, nine, nine. And Himmler wanted to end uh, the Jewish race. And so, uh, and you know, the day of the transport, that the day the girls arrive, um, is um, that date is um, connected to a e lunar eclipse that is trying to his birth date, which is you know, I, it was just like it's so complicated, I can't explain it. I could write it very carefully and have somebody proof it over and over again. <laughs> it was. But I truly believe that that's, that's what was up for him. And, um, and it's a chapter in the book that, um, you know, I think is pretty interesting. Absolutely. Well, we invite everyone to, you know, get a copy of the book. If you haven't already read it, it's a wonderful story, um, of course, based on these true events. And we're so grateful that you're here with us today. Thank you for sharing. Um, and I invite- out now, by the way, the paperbacks just come out. Wonderful. So Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and we also look forward to watching the film, the documentary film. There's Dr. Romer with the book. He's showing it to us. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you all for being with us here this evening. Um, Cindy added on the chat here, once again, our website where you can see all the events that we have coming up. Um, I also mentioned that the podcast is coming back up this Sunday. So we invite everyone to listen up um, and tune into that as well. And thank you all. I hope you have a good evening. And Thanks again I, for commemorating the, the Liberation Day with us here at the Ackerman Center. Thank you so much as well. And I will, um, I just put in the uh, link to 999, the movie for everybody. Thank you. You can subscribe to our newsletter and uh, get updates. And thank you very much for all of the work you are doing for education and for Holocaust memory. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.